Hey, happy Father's Day to everyone out there, especially all you dads. And I got another one of my Father's Day shirts on here, and uh, it is my favorite day of the year. I like it better than my birthday, and I like it better than Christmas. And I'm uh, looking forward to having some time with, with my family today. Hope you're going to have a blessed Father's Day as well. Of course, we're in the book of Revelation where we've been for a while, and we're doing this study. We're in the tribulation period, those chapters from chapter 6 to 16. We're in chapter 13 today. And uh, we're going to just break this chapter up. It's, it, caught, it introduces two characters who are in league with the devil, okay? Um, the beast from the sea and the beast from the, from the earth, basically. And um, uh, the beast from the earth is also called the false prophet in other chapters. So we're going to leave that for next week. We're going to focus on the beast from the sea. He's got another name, too, the Antichrist. So we're going to study this today. and. Uh, Basically, we're going to get a, I'm trying to try to give you a character sketch of the Antichrist who has not appeared in the earth yet. The Antichrist makes his appearance. It's a subtle, he doesn't come on the scene like gangbusters. He comes in slowly and subtly, and then he makes his meteoric rise and gathers all his attention. We'll get to all of that in the half hour we have here together, but we're going to get a description of who the Antichrist is. He's not named in scripture. I will not be speculating on who the person is may be or may not be, um, but this is a very dangerous individual and is going to have a lot of power given to him by the devil himself. Well, I'm getting away ahead of myself. Let's pray and then we'll dig into the scripture today. Father, we're thankful on this Father's Day that you are our Heavenly Father. You are perfect in all your ways. Uh, Father, we thank you what it says there in, in James chapter 1, where uh, every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Lord, on this Father's Day, we turn to the scriptures to learn about end times, about the Antichrist and his influence in the world and how we want to avoid him at all costs. So, Father, I pray that we will learn something from scripture today. Holy Spirit, be our teacher, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're over there in uh, Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to cover the first 10 verses of Revelation 13. We're going to come cover a lot of other verses, too, from the Old Testament and some from the New Testament that talk about this person. It's called the beast from the sea. And believe me, he will look nothing like a beast. That is a sign and a symbol of his character. But this person called the Antichrist. Okay, let's pick it up there. Revelation 13, 1 to 10. Then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten, ten horns and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of the heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Boy, there's a lot here. Um... We want to talk about this person called the Antichrist. Where does he come from? There's a scene that John has here in verse 1. Uh, some of your English verses will say that he stood on the sand of the sea, which might be a reference to the dragon or Satan, but that's a better translation is I stood on the sea, meaning John, and he looked out at the sea, and from the sea he saw this beast rising up out of the sea. What does the sea represent? Let me give you a good quote about that. The sea is a, uh, an apt symbol of the agitated surface of unregenerated humanity. 
and especially of the seething cauldron of national and social life, out of which the great historical movements of the world arise. Now, that was pretty wordy, wasn't it? Here's a better, more right, Reader's Digest version. The sea represents all the nations of the Gentiles, the world system, this antichrist, this figure who's going to have political prominence. He's going to have charisma. He's going to uh, you know, be winsome, attractive. Uh, he's going to have influence. He's going to rise up out of this sea of Gentile humanity, all the nations of the world and their political systems and their ways and their dealings. He's going to rise up out of it. That's what the sea represents. That's where this, this beast came from. Now, he doesn't look like a beast. He's a sign, just like the, in the last chapter we looked at, you know, the woman was a sign for Israel. The dragon was a sign for the devil. So the beast here, the Antichrist, this figure of the Antichrist, this is a sign. He does not look like a beast. He will not look like a beast. By the way, it will be a he, a person. Okay, so not a system. It will actually be a, fig a figure, a person in history. We've seen different world rulers through the ages that some have tried to identify as the Antichrist. Certainly they were Antichrist-like in their behavior. Uh, Adolf Hitler comes to mind. Okay, uh, many of the other despots and rulers of the world, Ceausescu, uh, you know, P Pol Pot, uh, Idi Amin, people like that um, have been identified. There, none of those people were or are the Antichrist. The Antichrist has not shown up yet. We have not seen him on the world stage as yet. Okay, so let's look at some other verses that talk about the Antichrist before we get into his description. Uh, and there's three different animals that that John describes, and they, they mirror what Daniel saw in his vision, chapter 7. We will be getting to that. Okay, so whew, we got to get going here. All right, so Paul talked about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, and then verse 8. Look what uh, he said here. He said, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, meaning the day of the Lord, unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin or the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So this Antichrist is going to act like he's God. The Roman emperors, you know, they all said that about themselves too. They said that they were God. They, uh, Christians were forced to uh, pinch incense and say Caesar is God. If you didn't do that, they threw you to the lines or they executed you some other way. And that was the time that, that John was writing. And he was writing in the, the uh, he was exiled to Patmos by D Domitian, the one emperor there. But though pretty much all the emperors, Roman emperors, all said they were God. And that was so this whole emperor worship thing. And so this. So they, in some ways, they mimicked the Antichrist. They had the Antichrist spirit, but they weren't the Antichrist that has come on. on. So they're all kind of precursors. Verse 8 of 2 Thessalonians 2 says this, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The good news about that verse is the Antichrist is not going to win this thing. He's going to rise to prominence. He's going to have a lot of influence. He's going to do a lot of damage. People are going to worship him. They're going to think that he's the savior of the world, but he's not. He's a false savior. He is a cheap imitation of the real thing. And God is going to grind him to powder in the end. So he's not going to get away with it. Let's keep looking at some other verses here. Uh, over in 1 John, same author of Revelation is, is John. He wrote this before Revelation, of course. And the word Antichrist doesn't actually appear that many times in scripture, the concept of who he is, man of lawlessness, boastful one, arrogant one. There's different titles given to him or descriptions, but the actual word Antichrist is not used that often, even though it's the same person that we're talking about. There's actually a lot of verses that talk about the Antichrist, but John does use the term in his epistles. Look what it says in 1 John 2, verse 18, and then in verse 22, it says, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Antichrist means exactly that, against Christ or an imitation of Christ. 
so against what Jesus is doing. So there's that spirit, anything that's against Jesus, God's work in the, in the world, is a spirit of antichrist. But he's not the person called the antichrist. Okay, verse 22, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Because remember, we read that verse in 2 Thessalonians that the Antichrist is going to position himself in the temple and say, I'm God. So he's, he's going to deny the Father and the Son. So that's going to be very critical and very key for us to understand that. Uh, later, 1 John 4, uh, verses 1 to 6, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the Spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Antichrist isn't in the world, but the Spirit of the Antichrist is in the world, preparing the way for the Antichrist. Let's keep reading. Verse 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, these false prophets who've got the Antichrist spirit he's talking about. You are of God, little children, have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So, you and I as believers in Christ need to continue to hold to the truth. The more we hold to the truth, the more it's going to sort of rankle those who are following the spirit of Antichrist, those who are not following God. And there's going to be some, some headbutting there. Expect some opposition if you want to be a Christian in this world. It's not going to be smooth sailing, just carrying on and, and you're going to be untouched. There's going to be some, there's going to be some opposition to that. Second John, verse 7, the second epistle of John, verse 7, look what he said here, there. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So we see also the antichrist does not acknowledge the coming of Jesus. When you and I say, oh, in Christmas, a wonderful season, the baby Jesus was born, God became a man. The antichrist said, that's just, that's just a fallacy. That's just a fairy tale. It's not true. He's not going to acknowledge that Jesus came in the flesh. So it's really important that you and I recognize that. If Daniel gave a description of the Antichrist in uh, Daniel chapter 11. This is very interesting here. I'm just going to read the verse. I'm not going to comment a lot on it, but I'm going to let you figure this out. This is a description that Dan Daniel got of the Antichrist. Okay, from Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 and 37. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. That sounds very antichristly. Shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done. So he blasphemies against the god of gods. Yes, yeah. he shall regard neither the god of his father's nor the desire of women. He will not desire women, this figure, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all, saying he is God. Hmm. Interesting what Daniel said there about the Antichrist. He would not desire God because he thinks he's God. He would also not desire women. So he's not heterosexual. Okay, that's clear from that verse there. Won't say anything more on that. All right, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about this description of this beast that came out of the sea of humanity. Um, again, the, the, the Antichrist is not going to pounce on the scene and have it just uh, immediately. It's going to be a subtle thing where he worms his way through and gets to the top and sort of establishes himself as the top dog in the world, as it were, and that people are going to just gush over him. You know, there was um, quotes of, uh, well, actually, I might, if I find it here, I'll, I'll quote it for you. Um, you know, we, when Hitler had his rallies and this type of thing, um, you know, the way that, that, that the nations went after him and, and or the, the, uh, the people of his nation, um, because of the way he carried himself with such charisma and he was very winsome, um, people 
uh, followed after him. But uh, I don't know if I can find here. Anyway, I, I can't find it. But the fact is, even if you went into history and looked at uh, Hitler's, uh, some of his rallies, the way he did it, and if he saw a rally, like the Nuremberg rally, this type of thing, and people were worshiping this man. You know, um, now he wasn't the Antichrist, but he certainly carried an Antichrist spirit in what he did. But look what, uh, in this book by Dr. David Jeremiah called After the Rapture, it's actually a book written for people who've been left behind after the Lord came. It's intended for that. He gives some descriptions here. He, he quotes um, a scholar by the name of John Phillips, and he talks about the, the Antichrist rise and reception in the world. So we're looking here at how it says in uh, Revelation 13 uh, that this beast was rising up the sea. He had seven heads and ten horns. You know, the... Um, the the heads are empires, the horns are nations. Empires like the Babylonian Empire, the Medo Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire. Okay, and that, those were all empires, of course, that happened during Daniel's time or leading into Daniel's time. There, starting with that, uh, more on that in a minute. But look what what uh, John Phillips says about the Antichrist rise and reception. He says the world will go delirious with delight at his manifestation. He will be the seeming answer to all its needs. He will be filled with all the fullness of Satan, handsome with a charming, rackish, devil-may-care personality, a genius, superbly at home in all the scientific disciplines, brave as a lion and with an air of mystery about him to tease the imagination or to chill the blood as occasion may serve, a brilliant conversationalist in a score of tongues, a soul-captivating orator, he will be the idol of all mankind. You need to understand, this person, whoever this person will be, will have such an influence. We so, they have such a magnetic and attractive personality that, that the world will just be captivated. Now, by the way, when I say this, not everyone, believers in Jesus Christ, will not be wooed and bowled over by the Antichrist. They're going to see the Antichrist for who he really is. True believers in Christ, okay? So those in the tribulation period who have received the message from the uh, 144,000 Jewish evangelists that was talked about in chapter 7, you know, and have now received Christ as Savior, they aren't going to be fooled by this. They're going to know that he's not the real deal. He gets all his instructions from Satan, so he has authority, he has a lot of pomp, he has a lot of arrogance, influence, but it's all been given to him by Satan. Um, so, and yet God allows it. So his authority is given by Satan, because that's what it says there. Um, in verse two, it says, the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. But later in verse five, it said, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to do this for 42 months, the latter half, the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Verse nine. It, uh, sorry, verse eight. So verse seven, verse seven, it was granted to him or given to him to make war with the saints and overcome. Them. God allowed this because God is going to make a distinction during that tribulation period. Are you with me? Or are you with him? I'm going to make you de declare who your allegiance is. Is it to God or is it to Satan? You're going to have to make a choice. You now you and I have that choice to make today. This is before the tribulation period. You and I need to make a decision. Am I going to follow God or am I going to follow Satan and the world system? And God is going to make a separation and a distinction between those who belong to him, those who belong to Satan and the world system. Listen to this other quote uh, I want to give you here um, about Satan. Uh, sorry, about, uh, um, about, oh, sorry, about the Antichrist. Again, um, so it says, uh, John Phil paints one of the most vivid, vivid portraits of the Antichrist. It says here, the Antichrist will be an attractive and charismatic figure, a genius, a demon-controlled, devil-taught charmer of men. He will have answers to the horrendous problems of mankind. He will be all things to all men, a political statesman, a social lion, a financial wizard, an intellectual giant, a religious deceiver, a masterful orator, a gifted organizer. He will be Satan's masterpiece of deception, the world's false messiah. 
With boundless enthusiasm, the masses will follow him and readily enthrone him in their hearts as the world's savior and God, but he's not the real thing. So those are people who do not belong to Christ. They are bowled over and wooed and charmed by this political leader, this antichrist. Uh, remember I said to you earlier, I couldn't remember, funny, I found it now, about, about Hitler's sway over the crowds. And here's a, here's a quote here from uh, Charles Colson's book, Kingdoms in Conflict. He talked about how the rallies that Hitler had in Nazi Germany were well-orchestrated events, and they were played out in crowded concert halls and places like that. He says uh, he manipulated German people as an orchestra playing solemn symphonic music the orchestra stro- stops. A hush falls over the strangely ordered crowd and thousands of people crane their necks to see. Then a stately patriotic anthem begins and from far in the back, walking slowly down the wide central aisle, comes Hitler. Finally, the Führer himself rises to speak, beginning in a low velvet voice which makes the audience unconsciously lean forward to hear. He speaks of his love for Germany. And gradually his pitch increases until he reaches a screaming crescendo. But his audience does not think his rasping shouts excessive. They are screaming with him. This is exactly how the Antichrist is going to work in the world. He's going to just rise quietly. He's not going to burst on the scene. He's going to work his way through and wiggle his way through to the top. And he's going to gather people and gather steam along with him until they get to the point where it's hook, line, and sinker. He's going to have people in his grasp. Now, the description of this beast is that, that John had was the beast, which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth was like the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him all his authority. Okay. So let's take a look at that. Let me just read something each of that. So it says that he was, I saw that he was like a leopard. Leopard is, that indicates agility, cat-like vigilance, uh, craft, fierce cruelty. Okay. That re- re- represents the Greek empire, okay? Uh, the bear, he had the feet of a bear, uh, indicate the slow strength and the power to crush. That would definitely be the Medo-Persian empire. And then he also had the mouth of a lion, blends massive strength with feline dexterity, following a, a stealthy and perhaps unobserved policy of repression with the sudden terrors of hostile edict. That's the Babylonian Empire. So that was Babylon. And Daniel saw this. Uh, let me see here. Over da- there in Daniel chapter 7, that's exactly, Daniel saw it as four beasts, okay? And John has them all wrapped up in one there. But all of them are mentioned. All the leopard, the bear, and the lion are all mentioned. And get to Daniel 7 here. So Daniel had this vision when Belshazzar was king, verse 1 of chapter 7. Daniel Daniel had a dream and visions of his head uh, while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. And the male... Sorry. I skipped the page there. Uh, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. So he, Daniel's vision sees it as four different beasts. John sees the, the beast culminating all of these attributes in one person. So he says here, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. That's Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire. Uh, verse five, and suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said to thus to its to arise, devour much flesh. That's the Medo-Persian Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire, the fall Babylonian Empire. After this, I looked and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. That's the Greek Empire that succeeded the Medo-Persian Empire. Verse 7, after this, I saw in the night vision of behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it and had ten horns. We've seen that the Antichrist in John's vision had ten horns. We saw that Satan had ten horns. Okay. 
Again, the horns representing nations. Um, verse 8 of Daniel 7, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots, and there in his horn, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Okay, so again, the Antichrist rises subtly, knocks out three of these horns, three of these nations, and the others just seed to that to this one. They say, like, like who can? Matter of fact, it was said there uh, about what the people said about the beast. Um, who was able to make war with them? Verse four: They worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, "Who's like the beast? Who's able to make war? Let's turn. We we may as well follow this guy. We're no one else is going to be able to stand up against him." And so then he becomes very winsome, promises peace. Uh, wow, we're trying to get into it and, and develop it today, but making a pact with Israel for a seven-year peace treaty with Israel, which will be broken halfway through that. Of course, the last three and a half years, of the tribulation period, that will be broken. And uh, there's great, there's uh, great uh, ter- tribulation and, and terrible things happening to God's people. Daniel 7, I shouldn't have turned against it, I it continues here because it talks about the fact that God's people, those who have surrendered to Christ, they're going to be persecuted by this Antichrist and his minions. And so it's God will walk through with his people, will not forsake them. But there is going to be a price today if you will going to stand for God. Now, even today's world, if you want to be a Christian today's world, you can't expect people that light with this movie with things. You just got to try to get through unscathed. You're unscathed. You're probably going to have to compromise. It should be. And so look what it says there in Daniel chapter 7, verse 21 and verse 25. 21, I was watching and the same bone was making war against the saints and prevailing against. Verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints, the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saint should was given in you his aim. In other words, the Antichrist is going to have his way persecuting guys, the people who are on the earth in that latter half, in that civilization to the last in that year. He said there, all these, well, on the third, verse 8, will worship you. I'm back in Revelation 13. Whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Christians or Jewish people who accept the Christ Messiah are not the one who worship them to antipray. Their names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. So the people that are giving allegiance to him and, and are wooed by him are the unbelievers in the world. Those are the people that have bought into this system to, that have been basically bowled over and wooed by the Antichrist at his pompous, arrogant words and his promises false of the army. But true believers, don't buy it for a set. But they know that the, the, the pressure is going to be ratcheted up here. So it says here, if anyone has a ear, let him hear. Jesus had said that, but seven church at Revelation, remember chapter 2 and 3, there's a warning to them, so you have an ear to hear, they keep it out of your Now he says in verse 9, uh, verse 10, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. He says, some of you, if you're destined for captivity, he's not going to believe it was here. That's how it's going to end for your physical life, but that's not the end. If it's the sword, that's how it's going to end for some of you as well. Again, with the price of days of all that in Christ, but it's not the also that place. It's not eternal death. The last words is said to a year of patience and the faith of the saints. Plus the year of faith. You've got to keep going to the end. God will help you. He's going to walk with us through this. I want to encourage you. The Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist is in the world today. Just that from the system, we got to be very, very careful about political systems in our world today. We're, we're not to fold with full allegiance to our political system. I don't care what kind of strike we follow in your country. What's the other kind of thing? Uh, you're very, very careful about that. The only one that can deliver, the only emperor, the only king will be king of the only king will be king of Lord and Son. So we need to be very careful that. Follow God said, in the end, no political system is going to be St. Christ. We were expected to be his kingdom, his alone, his alone. And so, but we have nothing to worry about with the case. So, 
The Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist in the world today, deceiving, mocking God, deceiving uh, uh, people, awakening God. But if our interests focus on Christ, we will say, we'll see him come. And we will be doomed by the law. Let's pray. Father, we just get information. We mean to just more than ever be vigilant about our relationship with Jesus Christ, being ourselves to him, man. Father, we know we're talking during the first well, tribulation period. Those people there who are going to need to be really toppled down as fast as the seatbelt decide, I'm going with God no matter what. Father, but really, we also have say, some of the sitting right here before Christ comes. Just pray, Lord, and help us to be more and more committed to you, surrendering even daily to you our lives. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. We're going to check those up next week and look at the other accomplice with the with the uh, antichrist the false prophet who's also in the league with, with Satan. look at that as 